In this PowerPoint, we'll continue examining the basis for the quantum mechanical model of the atom by looking at the wave nature of matter. Remember that we started our discussion of quantum theory by noting that classical physics treated light and matter as having completely distinct characteristics. Quantum theory, however, recognizes their dual nature. In a previous PowerPoint, we discussed the dual nature of light, how it behaves as a wave and a stream of particles called photons. In this PowerPoint, we'll discuss how matter specifically matter on the microscopic scale like electrons, also has a dual nature and can behave like a particle as well as a wave. Finally, we'll find that the limitations of Bohr's model of the atom can actually be overcome if we look at the behavior of, electro of electrons in terms of waves. So the idea that matter could have wave-like properties was first proposed by Louis de Broglie, a French graduate student in physics in his PhD dissertation. He was building upon the work done by Einstein on the wave-particle nature of photons and proposed that this idea could be extended to matter as well. And using Einstein's equations, he further went on to provide his own mathematical equation that could be used to define the wavelength of motion of any particle. It's known as the de Broglie wavelength. So the Greek symbol lambda stands for wavelength, just as it does in our light equations, and it's given in units of meters. H is Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds. M stands for our mass of the particle in units of kilograms. And the V term is the speed at which that particle is actually moving in units of meters per second. So the de Broglie wavelength is equal to Planck's constant divided by the mass of a particle divided by the speed of that particle. And in order for these units to cancel out and give us meters for our wavelength, we actually need to use an expanded unit for joules. It turns out that one joule is actually equal to a kilogram times meter squared divided by second squared. When we use this expanded unit for joule, what you'll find is that our kilograms will cancel out, our seconds will cancel out, and one of our meters cancels out to leave us with a final unit of meters for the de Broglie wavelength. So let's apply this equation to some different types of matter and see what we get for wavelength. We'll start with the Earth. So the Earth is pretty massive. It's 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. It's moving at a speed of 3 times 10 to the 4th meters per second around the sun. If we plug both of these values into our equation for the de Broglie wavelength, they'll go in the denominator of that ratio. So two pretty large values going into the denominator and being divided into a pretty small value makes for a very small value as a result. So the de Broglie wavelength for the Earth is 4 times 10 to the negative 63. So this is well beyond our measurement capabilities. But we're dealing with a pretty massive particle here. So let's look at something that's a little bit smaller. Let's try a baseball. A baseball is 0.143 kilograms on average. And let's look at uh, 42 meters per second for the speed, which is about 95 miles per hour. If we were to plug these values into the denominator of our equation, we'd end up with 1.1 times 10 to the negative 34 meters. So smaller mass and slower speed will result in a longer wavelength but this value is still well below our limits of detection. So if the baseball is moving in a uh, wave-like manner, we can't see it. But let's get even smaller. Electrons are much, much smaller than this. 
So an electron has a mass of 9 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. And a relatively fast moving electron is moving at about 5.9 times 10 to the sec 6 meters per second. So if we plug these values into our denominator and divide into Planck's constant, we find that we actually get 1 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. So this is within the detectable range. 10 to the negative 10 is on the order of X-ray radiation. We could actually measure this. So the next step then is to observe the wave-like mo movement of electrons. Now the wavelength is still too small for us to visually see, but if electrons behave as waves, we should be able to detect that behavior because they should diffract and interfere with each other just as waves do. Do you remember Thomas Young's double slit experiment for light? He shone light through two narrow slits and observed a larger interference pattern showing that the light spread out from the slits and added together constructively and destructively. And this was the first proof that light behaved as a wave. Well, we can apply that same idea to electrons. We can direct a stream of electrons at two narrow slits and allow those electrons to pass through. On the other side, we can set up detectors to show where the electrons actually end up. And if the electrons behave only as particles, you should only see two lines on the detector screen exactly opposite the two slits. But if the electrons have any wave-like character, you should actually see a diffraction pattern, multiple lines, more than two, resulting from interference from the interactions of the waves as they spread out after passing through the slit. So they've done this experiment, and here are some sample results. This is what they saw after 100 electrons had passed through the double slit on the screen, the detector screen opposite. This is 3,000 electrons passing through the two slits. And this is after 70,000 electrons had passed through. So the electrons are producing much more than just two lines opposite the slits. This indicates that the electrons are behaving like waves. They are spreading out and they are interfering with each other to produce diffraction patterns. So electrons, just like light, can act like waves and particles. So how does this happen? It's not well understood still. It's made even more confusing by observations of single electrons passing through a double slit. If a single electron passes through the double slit, you would expect that you wouldn't get an interference pattern. Interference patterns rely on two distinct waves interacting. With only one electron, you'd expect only one wave. But when they did this and passed only a single electron at a time, they still got an interference pattern. And this suggests that the wave nature of the electron is an inherent property of that individual electron. So even though we can't clearly explain how electrons behave as waves, the fact that they do gives us a way to explain how electrons can orbit the nucleus in Bohr's discrete and stable energy levels. So we have to consider those energy levels or orbits as standing or stationary waves. And if you've ever played an instrument, you've had some experience with standing sound waves. And the concept is similar for electron orbitals. Let's take a guitar string as an example. Now, when you pluck a string on a guitar, it produces a specific note. And that note reflects the standing waves that are produced on the string and then carried through the air as sound. So when you pluck the string, you actually produce vibrations. And those vibrations are carried to the end of the string, which is anchored to the guitar, and then reflected back. 
and the reflected waves then interact with the original vibrations on the string. When the reflected waves and the original vibrations are in phase, constructive interference can occur, and a standing wave develops so that the string continues to vibrate at that specific frequency. And the waves that end up persisting or resonating produce that clear musical note. So when you pluck a guitar string and you produce that note, that note actually has multiple tones associated with it, or harmonics. And that's because you actually produce multiple standing waves. The fundamental or first harmonic has the longest wavelength, but there are other shorter resonant wavelengths known as harmonic overtones. And this graphic shows the fundamental and the first four overtones for the standing waves in a string. And notice that the fundamental and the harmonics are ultimately, their wavelengths are ultimately related to the length of the string in whole number multiples. The integers on the side here indicate the number of half wavelengths for that particular frequency that fit the length of the string. So you'll also see this whole number multiple relationship in quantum mechanics. Remember the integers used to describe Bohr's energy levels, all whole numbers. And we'll see that repeated again in other quantum numbers associated with a quantum mechanical model, which we'll explore in a later PowerPoint. Notice as well that in each of these standing waves, there are portions of the string that vibrate at full amplitude and portions that don't appear to move at all. So these are known as nodes and antinodes of the standing wave. The nodes are the spot where the string doesn't move, like the middle of the second harmonic wave, while the antinodes are the spots where the string vibrates at full amplitude. And again, these are concepts that you'll see repeated in the standing wave patterns associated with electron orbital waves of the quantum mechanical model. So are electron orbitals really like guitar strings? Sort of. Instead of being tied at two ends, though, the electrons are actually traveling in circles, circular orbits around the nucleus. And waves traveling in a circle can interact where the orbit joins together again. Like the string example, though, the particular wavelengths that reinforce each other or produce standing waves in a circle are ultimately related to the whole number multiples of the number of waves you can fit into the circumference of that circle. Electron orbitals are also actually three-dimensional. So the standing wave patterns that develop for electrons are actually three-dimensional. We'll look at these different patterns and shapes in more depth in another PowerPoint. First, though, we need to discuss some complications to the wave-particle duality of the electron and how it impacts our understanding of electron orbitals. If the wave-particle duality of electrons is not confusing enough, we're going to add another level of complication to the picture. There's a classic experiment that scientists did to try to observe electrons behaving as both waves and particles at the same time. The experiment is a variation on the double slit. They set up a laser beam in between the slits and the detector. And as an electron passed through the slit into the laser beam, it would produce a flash of light exactly where it crossed. And in this way, the scientists hoped that they could see the exact position of the electron as it passed through the slits and how it was actually behaving as a wave, its wave-like motion, before it reached the detector and produced the interference pattern. The problem was, when they did this, when they introduced the laser beam, 
the interference pattern completely disappeared. On the detector screen, all they would see is two thin lines exactly opposite the slits. And it seems that in trying to observe the exact position of the electron, scientists introduced enough of a disturbance to the electron movement that it became impossible to observe the wave-like interference of that electron. So at this scale of measurement in the microscopic world, observation or measurement of anything introduces a disturbance to what you're trying to measure. So in order to measure the position of the electron, for example, you have to force the electron to interact with a photon in the laser beam. This is what produces the spark that you can actually visually see. But this is a disturbance to the electron, and it prevents it from behaving as a wave in such a way that produces an interference pattern. The net result is that we can't observe the wave and particle nature of an electron at the same time. They are what we call complementary properties. And that means that the observation of one disturbs the observation of the other. Werner Heisenberg mathematically defined this complementary relationship through his uncertainty principle. And his uncertainty principle states that there is a limit to the certainty with which we can observe either the exact position or the velocity of a particle. So position is an observation of particle-like nature, while velocity is associated with motion and represents wave nature. So to observe the position of an electron, for example, by making it collide with a photon in a laser beam, we have to disturb its velocity and therefore its wave-like motion. So mathematically, this is the statement of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. The uncertainty in the position of the particle is represented by the term delta x. The larger this value is, the less precisely we know the exact position of that particle. m is the mass of the particle. And delta V represents our uncertainty in our measurement of the velocity of the particle or the wave-like nature. These three values combined have to be greater than or equal to a constant value on the right. So that constant value is defined by Planck's constant, which is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds where a joule is one kilogram times a meter squared divided by a second square. And that value is divided by four and by the constant pi, which is 3.14, the value you're familiar with from your math classes. So on the right, these values can be reduced to a constant limit that's on the order of 10 to the negative 33 kilograms times meter squared divided by seconds. So this is a really small value. It represents the limit of our certainty with which we can know both the position and the velocity of anything. And as we've already discussed, this value is well below our ability to measure. So how could we approach this very, very small limit in uncertainty? Well, remember that electrons are tiny with a mass of 9 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. And if we factor that mass into the equation, we're already almost to our limit. So if we measure the velocity or wave-like nature, to the point of one meter per second for our uncertainty, well, that means that the minimum uncertainty in our position has to be on the order of 10 to the negative two meters. Well, that's a centimeter. And a centimeter is pretty small, but it's still 
a hundred million times larger than the average size of an atom. So the net result is that for tiny objects like electrons, we can either observe the position or particle-like nature of the electron with certainty, or we can observe the velocity or wave-like nature of the electron with certainty. But we can't measure both at the same time with any certainty. And in describing electron orbitals, ultimately we want to describe the wave-like pattern of electron movement. And that means that we cannot know with any certainty the exact position of the electron. So this leads us to the key takeaway for this entire discussion, this entire PowerPoint. The quantum mechanical model of the atom describes electron orbitals as three-dimensional standing wave patterns. And because the model focuses on describing the wave patterns, it can only describe the most probable location of an electron within any atom, not its exact position. So the mathematical description of this model is given by Schrodinger's equation. And this is actually the simplest version I can find. We will not be solving this equation, don't worry. I wanted to show it to you though, so you could see how it incorporated many of the different factors we've discussed, particularly the standing wave function. So solving this equation produces a set of three quantum numbers that describe the different electron orbitals associated with an atom. And we'll discuss those quantum numbers in the next PowerPoint. So in summary, electrons behave as both waves and particles. Electron orbitals are three-dimensional standing waves that circle around the nucleus. And when observing the wave nature of electrons, it's impossible to know the exact position of the electrons at the same time. The quantum mechanical model describes the most probable location of electrons in three-dimensional standing wave orbitals.